and is also interested <laughs> in <laughs> exploring a potential career in litigation. Congratulations. Thank you, R.D. And now I'd like to call on Professor Greg Hagen of the uh, Faculty of Law to introduce uh, Richard Stallman. Nothing about uh, intellectual property. <laughs> I'm no longer going to use those terms. Mr. Stallman founded the Free Software Foundation and developed a form of free software that everyone has the freedom to copy, redistribute, and alter as they see fit. Today, the GNU Linux system is used on tens of millions of computers. From a legal point of view, Stallman pioneered the concept of copy left, which is the idea that anyone who redistributes software with or without changes must pass along the freedom to further copy and change it. He has authored several copy left licenses, which should be of interest to lawyers, including the GNU General Public License, the world's most popular free software license. Mr. Stallman has received the Association for Computing Machinery's Grace Hopper Award, a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the Electronic Front Frontier Foundation Pioneer Award, and the Takeda Award for Social Economic Betterment, as well as several honorary doctorate degrees. I counted seven. I'm pleased to introduce Richard Stallman. Well, if I were the kind of speaker who's constantly changing his views, I might need a pseudo-podium, but I think I won't pay much attention to this podium. Since you're not all from the free software community, I had better start with a brief introduction to what free software is all about, and then I can present the actual topic. Free software means software that respects the user's freedom. So it's free in the sense of freedom, not necessarily zero price. We're not even talking about price. It's too bad the English language doesn't have a word that clearly translates libre. In French, if you say logiciel libre, people know that you're not talking about price. But in English, the best word we've got is free. So I have to tell you, think of free speech, not free beer, to understand the meaning of the word free in the combination free software. You see, our society teaches people to judge programs solely based on practical convenience, to ask, how easy to use is it? How reliable? How efficient? What does it cost? And to ignore more important, deeper questions like, if I use this program, what does it do to my freedom? What does it do to my community? But these questions, ethical rather than short-term practical questions, are what the free software movement is concerned with. A program that's not free is non-free software, proprietary software, user-subjugating software. These programs keep users divided and helpless. Divided because every user is forbidden to share them. And helpless because the users don't get the source code, so they can't change the programs, they don't control what the programs do. They can't even study and check what those programs are really doing to them. And many developers put in malicious features to do things like spy on the users, restrict the users, intentionally restrict them, and even to attack them, like back doors. In fact, some proprietary programs have all three of these kinds of malicious features. For instance, Microsoft Windows. <laughs> Microsoft Windows and Mac OS 10 have such gross, disgusting backdoors that in fact their developers have the power to forcibly change the software in any way at any time and they don't have to ask the user before they do that. So what you can see is once the developer has some unjust power, the developer is likely to use that power to get more power, and the end result of that process is total power over the user and her, his computer. So that's what it is that the free software movement is against, letting the developer have power over the users. So a program is free software if you, the user, have the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code of the program and then change it to make the program do what you wish so that this way you decide 
what computing you're going to do. You are in control instead of the developers being in control. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to make and distribute exact copies of the program when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to make and distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. So if you have all four of these freedoms, the program is free software because the social system of its distribution and use is an ethical system, one that respects users' freedom and the user's community. <coughs> but if one of these freedoms is missing, then the program is proprietary software user subjugating software because the social system of its distribution and use is one that tramples the user's freedom and community. The existence of a non-free program in use is a social problem. The mere fact that people are using a non-free program is a social problem and our goal is to eliminate that problem from our society. So free software is not a technical question at all. It's not a question about how the program works or what it does. It's a question of the freedom that users do or do not have in using it. It's an ethical, social, and political question. Now, as the free software movement started to have some success, when the kernel Linux was added to the almost complete GNU operating system, which I had started in 1984, uh, and this combination, GNU plus Linux, started spreading and gaining millions of users, people started asking me to give more speeches about it, at least for a while, until they started thinking that the system was Linux and that it had been started by somebody else in 1991. And so they started sometimes asking questions at the end, including, do these ideas apply to anything other than software? Typically, they were being wise guys. So they said, what about hardware? Should hardware be free too? Well, that's a silly question. Because if, remember, the word free here refers to four specific freedoms. So let's try applying those same four freedoms to hardware, like uh, tables and chairs and shirts and computers and microphones. Well, should that be free in the same sense? Let's look at the four freedoms. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, would be the freedom to use the physical object as you wish. And in general, you have that freedom. Once you buy a physical object, you can do whatever you like. The manufacturer doesn't put on conditions of what you can or can't do. Now, there, of course, there are things that are illegal that you can't do it at all with or without that object, but that's a totally different issue and really has nothing to do with this. So the answer is, okay, freedom zero, generally you've got. What about freedom one, the freedom to change, study and change the source code? Well, a physical object with today's technology generally has no source code. We have to adapt this freedom. It could be the freedom to study and change the object itself. And there, again, you have this freedom, except that the ability to use it in practice is, is rather limited although that depends on the object. If you've got a wooden chair, there are a number of things you could do to change it that might even be useful. I know at least a few decades ago, people used to reupholster chairs. I've heard a rumor that they don't do it anymore, but I don't know. Uh, on the other hand, if you have these plastic and metal chairs, it's hard to do anything to change them that has any possible use. And a computer chip is impossible to change. Any attempt to change it would just destroy it. So the answer is you've got freedom one to the extent it's feasible to, to uh, exercise it, but that's often very limited. What about freedom two, the freedom to copy it and distribute the copies? Well, this is totally meaningless because there are no copiers for physical objects, with occasional rare exceptions. I'm told in India there are copiers for chairs that if you are in the Indian middle class and you want a chair copied, you just go to a furniture maker and say, copy this chair. And that that's the cheapest way to get a chair made in India. Well, okay, maybe in some cases freedom too is meaningful and is a real issue, but mostly it's not. And uh, what about freedom three? It's the same question. You know, if there are no copiers for chairs in your society, in my society, well then, whether we've modified it or not, there's still no copier. 
So freedoms two and three are, are not even relevant questions for chairs in our society today. Now, that might change in the future, but I'm talking about the ethical issues that we face today. So the answer is physical objects are as free as they could conceivably be. It's not because anybody's restricting you that your ability to do things with them is limited. It's because of the nature of the things. But there are some things to which this question does make sense, namely other information works that exist in many copies and that you might have a copy of. And then, and you might have your copy in a computer, which you could use then to copy it and to change it. And since you have the ability to do those things, whether you're allowed to do them is a real issue. And that is the issue that I'm speaking about today. Now, if you have an information work, a copy of one, and uh, it's not software, then in almost all cases, all that would possibly restrict what you can do with it is copyright law. So we can ask the same question from another direction by asking what should copyright law say about what you can do with these works. Now to understand anything about copyright law or the issues it raises, the first thing you need to do is recognize that the term quote intellectual property unquote is propaganda that spreads confusion because it lumps together laws that have nothing important in common. They're different at every level, in every detail, how they work is different, their effects are different, the public policy issues they raise are different. Unfortunately, if you've been exposed to that propaganda term, it sets your mind going trying to grasp at the most meager similarities you could find and give them too much importance. So it twists people's thinking and it impedes even understanding the facts of what these different laws say because that term gets you started assuming that, the, that these laws are species within one genus, that they're mostly similar and it's only a little, a little bit of detail that varies. Well, that's not true. If you start out with that false assumption, you're going to misunderstand everything. For the sake of clear thinking, we need to reject that term. We need to denounce that term and explain to people, as I'm explaining now, why that's the wrong way to understand any issue. Now, in order to do that and not have one's actions undermine one's words, it is necessary to stop using the term also. Anytime some class, book, activity, government committee, or even worst of all, law uses that term, it is harm. So we've got to fix them all. And if that takes a long time, well, a long journey starts with a single step. I've stopped using that term myself, and I hope some of you will do likewise. The issue I'm talking about today is about copyright law. None of what I'm saying has any relevance to patent law or to trademark law. They do different things. They work totally differently. In general, any time you hear anything about one of these laws, you should assume it is not relevant to any of the others. They are too different. Copyright law has evolved with copying technology. So it's useful to look at the history of copyright law to see how we got where we are, and that's tied up with the history of copying technology. Changes in technology can alter basic moral principles, which are too deep to be reached by that. But when we apply them to any practical question in our lives, we do it by looking at the consequences of our actions. And changes in the context can alter the consequences of the same action. And that can make the action more good or more bad than it used to be. For instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, then we would cease to treat murder as a crime. After you got uh, resurrected, you'd sue your murderer for the cost of your new body. In the US, we'd have to have uninsured murderer insurance. <laughs> Maybe in Canada, they'd be more sane about these things. In any case, let's look at the history of copying technology. Copying started in the ancient world, where you would do it with a writing implement on a writing surface. You'd read a copy of the book and you'd write another. This technology was not very efficient, but aside from that it had certain important characteristics. First of all, 
It had no essential economy of scale. To make 10 copies would take you 10 times as long as making one copy. It required no special equipment beyond the equipment for writing. And it required no special skill other than literacy itself. The result was a decentralized production of copies in that anyone who had a copy of a certain book and wanted another could make another copy anywhere. Now, as far as I can tell, there was no idea anything like copyright in the ancient world. If you had a copy of a book and you wanted to copy it, nobody ever said you weren't allowed to, except if the local ruler didn't like what the book said, in which case he might punish you horribly. But that was not exactly copyright. It was something closely related, namely censorship. Then there was a big advance in copying technology, the printing press which made copying a lot more efficient, but not uniformly more efficient, because some cases became a lot more efficient and others were not helped at all, because the printing press has a very big economy of scale. It takes a lot of work to set the type, but once that's been done, you can use it to make many identical copies very efficiently. So the printing press made mass production copying a lot more efficient and was of no relevance to making just a few copies because you wouldn't, it was more efficient to do that by hand. The printing press had other relevant characteristics. First of all, it was an expensive piece of equipment, the press and the type. Most people who could read and write didn't have a printing press. Second, they didn't know how to use it either, because running a printing press is a special skill different from reading and writing. I suppose most of them would have been able to learn to run a press if they wanted to, but mostly they didn't. The result of this was a centralized system of mass production of copies, where the copies of any book would be made in a few places and mass produced in each of them and then transported to people who wanted to buy them. For the first few centuries of printing, a lot of copies were still made by hand. This was typically either for very rich people, because it was to show how rich they were, or by poor people, because as the song goes, time ain't money if all you got is time. That song was popular in the 1930s, perhaps it will be a hit <laughs> next year. <laughs> There were poor people who couldn't afford a printed copy, but they had the time to write a copy, and they did. Copyright began in the age of the printing press. For instance, in Italy in the 1500s, if you wrote a book, you could then ask a prince to give you a monopoly on printing it. If you said nice things about the prince at the beginning of the book, then he would probably do that. Princes tended to give out monopolies over anything at all to reward whoever they wanted to reward. Uh, but it was sort of a custom that this was one kind of monopoly they would generally give. Copyright in England began as a system of censorship. I believe that was under Queen Mary and it was censoring the Church of England. It was a system of censorship. To publish a book you had to ask the state for permission and this was given as a permanent monopoly to one publisher. However, that system of censorship became obsolete. I think that was after the Glorious Revolution. So they started thinking about replacing the system of copyright and adopted a scheme to give the copyright to the author instead of the publisher and only for 14 years, I believe. And the idea developed then that copyright should be a scheme to artificially encourage writing and publication. And the means to this end was to give the author a way to make more money from publishing. But that was not the purpose. The purpose was promoting authorship. When the U.S. Constitution was written, there was a proposal that the Constitution should make copyright and entitlement of authors. You'd never believe this to hear what publishers say nowadays, but that was rejected. Instead, the Constitution gives Congress optionally the power to set up a copyright system, and it says that the justification for one, if there is to be one, is to promote progress, and also says it has to last for a limited time, ever since the publishers have been trying to get everybody to turn that into a dead letter. Copyright in the age of the printing press functioned as an industrial regulation because it didn't restrict what readers could do. It only restricted doing the things publishers could do. If you were restricted by it, it was because you were a publisher. Because it was an industrial regulation, 
it was generally uncontroversial, easy to enforce, and arguably beneficial for the public. It was generally uncontroversial because it gave the readers nothing to complain about. They weren't being restricted. Now, it's true that some readers continued copying by hand, but nobody ever thought of trying to sue them for copyright infringement because everyone understood it was supposed to be an industrial regulation. And I think, at least in the US, the first copyright law didn't even restrict hand copying by readers at all. And it was easy to enforce because it only had to be enforced on publishers. It's easy to find out who's publishing a book. You go to a bookstore and you say, who's publishing these books? Where do you get them? You don't have to invade everybody's home and everybody's computer. And it was arguably beneficial because the public traded nominal freedoms that it was not in a position to exercise and in exchange got some benefit, the benefits of more books being written. So if you have something that you can't use at all and you trade it for something of some value to you, you have gained. Whether or not it's the best possible deal you could have made, that's another question. But at least it's a beneficial deal. And that's how copyright was looked at in the age of the printing press, as a trade between the readers who naturally would have had the right to copy anything and authors. So it was an industrial regulation on publishers being wielded by the authors, but the purpose of the system was to benefit the general public. And if that were still true, I don't think I'd be objecting to it. But we have had another big advance in copying technology, that is, digital information technology. We are gradually moving from the age of the printing press to the age of the computer networks. Another big advance in the ease of copying, and once again, not uniformly effective for all kinds of copying. Here's what we had in the age of the printing press. Digital technology gives us something like this. The biggest benefit has been in making copies one by one. Yes, there's benefit also from mass production, but they're much closer together now in efficiency than they were in the age of the printing press. That brings us back to a situation a lot like the ancient world, where making copies one by one is perfectly feasible. Hundreds of millions of people can do it and want to do it. In the 20th century, Presses became a lot more efficient. Printed copies became really cheap. That's why they started making paperback books. And as a result, even poor people could usually buy a book rather than copy it by hand. And so the widespread practice of hand copying got forgotten and copyright law got changed so that formally it even covered hand copying. But nobody bothered to enforce it in such cases. So practically speaking, it was still, in effect, an industrial regulation. But now you put in digital technology and what have we got? The same law, even without changing what it says, has a totally different effect. And now it becomes a restriction on the general public under the control of the publishers in the name of the authors. It's wielded by the publishers because another change that happened was the publishers made it the case that they almost always got the uh, authors to cede these rights to them and the publishers are the ones that really wield them, typically in the name of the authors, with the benefit to the authors being rather small in a lot of cases. Well, ethically speaking, this change changes everything. We used to trade away certain freedoms and not mind it because we didn't have the ability to exercise them, but now we do and we want to. And as a result, that trade that was made is intolerable and it must be ended. A democratic government today would be saying, sorry authors, the freedoms that we traded away for on behalf of the public, we have to reclaim now because not to have these freedoms is intolerable. So we're going to have to reduce the size of this deal. We can measure the lack of democracy in our governments by their tendency to do the exact opposite. They have extended copyright powers to a, a way that was not conceived of in our countries in the age of the printing press. One form of extension is in the dimension of time. Copyright in the 1700s in England, which is where we got it from, lasted 14 years and maybe could be renewed, I can't remember, for another 14. Since then it's been extended and extended and extended until now, in some cases, it can last 150 years which is insane. But that's not enough 
for the publishers because what they really want is for nothing to ever to go into the public domain again. For instance, the movie companies say they want perpetual copyright, but even they don't, still don't have the power to amend the U.S. Constitution. So they came up with a scheme for perpetual copyright on the installment plan, where every 20 years they extend copyright by 20 more years for past works as well as future works. They did this in 1998 with a law we call the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act, because one of the companies that purchased it was Disney. Laws are for sale in the U.S. Congress. That's how it works. Sometimes there's a bidding war between two different groups of companies but there were no companies to oppose this one. Disney was aware that in a few more years, the copyright on the film Steamboat Willie was going to expire. Well, that film, which some people have called a cheap ripoff of Steamboat Bill, nonetheless was the first place where the character Mickey Mouse appeared. So when that film went into the public domain, uh, it would be possible for other animators to use that image of Mickey Mouse in their own works. Disney doesn't want this sort of thing to go both ways, so it paid for this law. So we call it the Mickey Mouse copyright law, and it extended copyright by 20 years on both past works and future works. Now, what rationale there is for promoting progress by extending copyright retroactively on works written in, say, the 20s and 30s escapes me completely. I don't know how it could possibly provide the now dead authors of those times more incentive to write more works back then. <laughs> now, if they have a time machine, apparently they haven't used it because our history books don't record that there was a tremendous burst of creativity once the artists and writers found out that they would get 20 more years of copyright because of this law. It's at least conceivable that 20 more years of copyright could provide more incentive to make works in the future, but not to anybody rational, because economists will explain that the discounted present value of 20 years of copyright starting 75 years from now is so small that it's not going to be a factor in any decision you might make. The only motive for this law was to preserve the lucrative monopolies that were scheduled to expire. But that only gets them 20 more years. The idea of perpetual copyright on the installment plan is that they're going to do it again in something like 2018, unless we stop them. And of course, they've been pushing this all around the world, trying to get various countries to make copyright last longer. So it's a fight everywhere. That's one dimension. But the other dimension, which is even more important, is the dimension of breadth of copyright. Which activities does copyright restrict and which does it leave alone? In the age of the printing press, no one ever conceived of having copyright cover all possible uses of a copyrighted work. Some activities were covered by copyright as exceptions within a space of unregulated uses. But the publishers think that digital technology can give them the opportunity to grab total control and set up a pay-per-view universe where anytime you want to even access any copy of a work, you'll have to get permission through programs that implement digital restrictions management. Digital restrictions management, or DRM, refers to a kind of malicious feature, namely the functionality of refusing to function. <laughs> Features where the product is designed not to work. With this, they aim to get the power they seek. The first place we saw this was in DVDs. DVDs usually have the movie or video in encrypted format, and the purpose of this encryption is to attack our freedom. It was so that the players, the authorized players, would be designed not to let us do some of the things we'd want to do. Originally, this format was secret, which was how they stopped people from implementing anything else to decode it. But people figured out the format and released a free software package capable of decrypting the video on a DVD. In 1998, the U.S. passed a law to censor this software. In fact, to censor any unauthorized software that can play a DVD that doesn't have the same limits built in as all the other DVD players. And in fact, not just for DVDs, but for any system of digital restrictions management. 
That law is called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And by it, the U.S. Congress clearly took the side of the publishers against the citizens of the U.S. We must refuse to start using products that are designed to attack our freedom. So you must never buy or rent or even accept as a gift a product which has digital restrictions management unless you possess the means to break the handcuffs. <laughs> so if you have the free software you could use to play a DVD, then it's okay to buy, rent, or accept as gifts these DVDs, but otherwise you should reject them. And that's what I do. I have a few DVDs, they're not encrypted. I always check, otherwise I won't take it. Since these features are typically imposed on the public by a conspiracy of companies, not by one company by itself. Rejecting them individually is not enough. Now, what do I mean by conspiracies? Well, let's use the DVD example. A group of companies designed the DVD format, and then they set up a DVD conspiracy requiring anybody that wanted to make DVD players to join the conspiracy in order to be told the secret format. And then, to join the conspiracy, they had to promise that they would make their DVD players restrict the user just like all the others. So this is a conspiracy to restrict the public's access to technology. Such conspiracy ought to be a felony. The executives of those companies should be in prison for what they did. If they had conspired to fix prices and only take our money, they would be prosecutable for that. They might very well be in prison. But when they conspire to take away our freedom, more important than our money, then our government is on their side. And they know this, which is why I know about the conspiracy. You see, it's not secret. They are so certain governments will support them against us that they don't feel the need to hide this conspiracy and restraint of trade. So the way you can find out about these conspiracies is to look at their websites. To organize our response, we have set up a campaign of protests against digital restrictions management, which you can find in the site defectivebydesign.org. Sign up and participate in our protests. What we have to do is to show mega corporations that if they design their products to attack our freedom, they will be hated. So we need big protests. We need your help. Your freedom is at stake. Movie companies are aware that even despite censorship, which in France goes to the point of making it a crime even to possess this software. In fact, the software is circulating everywhere and it's easy to get and they know that they can't stop people from playing DVDs with free software. Someday I suppose they will propose the death penalty for it. What they've done that they expect might really work is they designed another system of digital restrictions management called AACS, which I generally call the ACS because that's what we need to give it. Starting in 2011, manufacturers are not allowed to make analog video outputs. They speak of something they call the analog hole. And let me show you a couple of analog holes <laughs> that they say they want to plug. Their idea was that the AACS would be unbreakable. And then a couple of years ago, somebody published a program that undoes the encryption of AACS, but that was of no use because nobody knew the key. And then six months later, I saw a cute, adorable photo of two puppies. And on top of the puppies were 32 hex digits. <laughs> and I wondered why put these two things together? What have they got to do with each other? I wonder if those numbers are actually a key and that's if somebody put them on top of these puppies because they figured that way people would circulate the photo for the puppies and that way the number couldn't be suppressed. And that's what it was. That was the key to break the ax. Somebody posted it on Dig and the editors of Dig obediently to the Empire deleted it and someone else posted it and they deleted it and after a few hundred times they said, oh, we give up. We've tried our best to be loyal supporters of the Empire. Within a couple of weeks, this key was to be found in over 700,000 web pages. A big outpouring of hatred for DRM. But unfortunately, that didn't do the job. The companies that try to hit us with the axe 
change the key. And second, that was only enough for HD DVDs. And I'm told Blu-ray has another layer of digital restrictions management that nobody has managed to break. So unfortunately, it doesn't do the job. Thus, you must continue absolutely refusing to use Blu-ray discs in any way. The uh, threat of DRM is not just in video. It's also affected music. In fact, I see somebody with a corrupt disc inferior audio shirt. Really good, I love that. Corrupt discs is what we called these things that looked like CDs, but they were not valid compact discs because they didn't follow the format standards. They were designed so that you could play them in ordinary players, but you couldn't read them in your computer with free software. Now, I once gave a speech more or less like this one, and afterward, my host gave me some records of music from the region. One of them was by a musician I'd heard of, and I was really interested in listening to it, but fortunately, before I opened the package, I saw, instead of the compact disc logo, it had copy control. This disc can be played on Windows and Macintosh systems, meaning only with proprietary software and not by me. I gave it back unopened and said, here you see the face of the enemy. Please take this back to the store because they don't deserve to keep your money. Well, I'll never hear that music. That's life. Maybe I'll come across it somewhere in some other form, but I'm not, I'm not looking. Fortunately, we are seeing a retreat from DRM in the medium of music, and that's a very good thing. Part of the reason had to do with what happened when Sony had a clever scheme for digital restrictions management in corrupt disks. Their idea was that when someone put the disk into a computer, the disk would carry software that would be installed into the system silently without telling the user anything. What this program did was break the security on the machine and insert itself into the system the same way viruses do or the way crackers do if they gain access to the machine. It's called a rootkit. And this program changed the system so that reading the disk would be restricted. But it changed other things as well. For instance, it changed the commands you could use to examine the system so as to disguise its own presence there. And it also changed the commands to delete things so that they would have no effect when you tried to delete them. Now, all this is a felony. It's not the only felony Sony committed because part of this software was code that had been released under the GNU General Public License. And it was being distributed in violation of that license because the license says any program that contains any significant amount of that code must as a whole be released under the GNU GPL. Its source code must be made available to the users and they must get a copy of the license so that they know their rights. Sony didn't do any of these things. Commercial copyright infringement is a felony. Of course, Sony was never prosecuted. Our governments are fully aware that their mission is to maintain the power of their mega corporate masters over us. These laws don't apply to defend us from their masters. People did sue Sony. Unfortunately, the general condemnation of Sony focused only on the side issues, all the other nasty things Sony had done as part of their method of carrying out their fundamentally evil purpose to restrict us, and didn't focus on the evil purpose. So Sony settled these suits, promising that in the future when they attack our freedom, they would not do all the other nasty things. And Sony has learned its lesson. In the future, the rootkit will be built in before you get the computer, and it will be impossible to remove, and it will be called the axe. And that's what they're doing in the PlayStation 3, which is why nobody should buy them. No one is. That's good. Unfortunately, not quite no one. Even if it looks like they're on the way into the grave until the stake is through the heart, you don't know. Don't declare victory and ignore the danger. Take the full course of the antibiotic, even if it seems you're well. Even though DRM seems to be on the way out in music, we now see a renewed attempt to impose DRM on books. You see, publishers would like to deny readers traditional freedoms. Lend a book to your friend sell it to a used bookstore, 
borrow it from a public library, buy it anonymously by paying cash, and even the freedom to keep the book for as long as you wish, reading it as many times as you wish, and then pass it on to your heirs. It would be hard to pass laws taking away these freedoms from the readers of books. There are too many readers of books, and even with our sick forms of democracy, we could still resist. So they came up Although in the European Union, which is extremely undemocratic, they've managed to do so to some extent. Instead, they came up with a two-stage plan. The first stage was take away these freedoms for e-books, in which they faced little opposition because there were no e-books. They achieved that with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the U.S. and later in many other countries as well. And the second stage was convince people to switch from printed books to e-books. Well, they tried that in like 2000, 2001, 2002, and it just flopped. People didn't start using ebooks. One publisher had the idea that they could start off their line of encrypted user restricting ebooks with a bang using a biography of me. <laughs> so they found an author and he came to me and asked if I would cooperate and I said yes if they publish this biography without encryption. The publisher rejected that idea so I suggested another publisher who said yes and in fact the book was published under a free license which gives people all four freedoms. So you could actually download the sources and uh, publish your own modified version of the book. <laughs> The, that publisher's policy is when they accept a book, if the author then says, I want to make it free, they will. Their belief is that they do not lose any sales by doing this. In any case, ebooks flopped, but I could tell it wasn't because people cared too much about their freedom, it was for other side issues. So I started warning people they'll try again, and they are, with products like the Sony Shredder. They call it the Sony Reader, but. I think it's more accurate with the extra SH. And the Amazon swindle. <laughs> the swindle is that people who buy it don't recognize that they are ending all their friendships. Because people who won't lend books to their friends aren't friends. <laughs> Make sure your friends know and understand the implications of that product so that they don't accidentally or foolishly fall into cutting themselves off from their friendships. Don't wait for them to make the mistake before you explain to them. I hear they're going to be targeting students. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the US, fortunately for most of the world, only attack the freedom of people in the US. But when there is a social problem in the US, the US government doesn't try to fix it, but rather to impose it on the rest of the world. In the past few years, Canada has been the target. There was an unjust law proposal called C60, which was meant to restrict the distribution of the free software to break DRM. And that was replaced by C61, which was even worse, which would have criminalized any program capable of copying anything, which basically means every operating system would have violated that law and couldn't possibly work if it didn't violate the law. Well, that kind of outrageous stupidity is amusing, but the real danger is they'll fix that part. You see, we can't base our attack on those attempts to restrict us on the stupid mistakes they make. And we can't base it only on the harmful side effects that they might agree are undesirable because it's no guarantee there always will be harmful side effects. What if they solve those side problems and continue with their evil aim to attack your freedom? What you must do to defend your freedom is to condemn the evil purpose of those laws because copyright in Canada as in most countries is already far too restrictive. The changes that need to be made go in the other direction. Copyright power is being increased in many countries. But what should a just democratic government do to copyright law? Well, it should reduce copyright power in various dimensions. Here are my proposals. First of all, the dimension of time. I suggest shortening copyright to last 10 years from the publication of the work. Now, the reason I say 
from the publication of the work is that before the work is published, we don't have copies, so we're not losing anything if we can't copy the copies we don't have. So we might as well let the author have however long it takes to find a publisher. But then I propose 10 years. I don't say that 10 years is exactly the right amount, but I think it's a good first approximation, and so I propose it as what we should try. Because the publication cycle in recent decades has got shorter and shorter. I don't know the facts about Canada, but in the US, almost all books are remaindered within two years and out of print within three. Well, 10 years is more than three times the usual publication cycle, so I think it's comfortably plenty. Not everyone agrees with that proposal. I once proposed the same things I'm saying here, at a panel discussion with science fiction writers. And the award-winning writer sitting next to me said, 10 years, that would be horrible. Anything more than five years is intolerable. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised too. Because when the publishers demand more power over us, they always say they're doing it for those creators. That's what they like to call the authors and artists. Because it compares them to a deity and suggests that we should bow down to them. They always do it in their name. So I had naively believed that this was for real and that the authors would also want more copyright. Well, there are a few who do, namely those who are tremendous hits and who are raking in lots of money and have come to want the money above all. That's only a tiny fraction of them. Most of the time, the publishers that demand these extra powers over us in the name of the authors are grinding those same authors and artists into the ground with their heels. For instance, that one. Although he'd won an award, his book wasn't a bestseller. As far as he could tell, it was out of print. His contract said that when the book went out of print, the rights would revert to him. But the publisher refused to admit that it was out of print and was using the copyright on his own book to stop him from distributing copies, which he wished to do so that people could read it. <laughs> Now those authors who have not become accustomed to riches still have the desire that makes people start to be authors. They want people to read their work. And the copyright on his book was being used to stop him from giving copies to people. So he had a legal dispute with his publisher about this. And he realized that more than five years of copyright was not likely ever to do him any good. Well, he thinks 10 years is too much, and maybe he's right. Maybe five years is better. But I propose 10 years as a somewhat more cautious first whack at the problem. And after that, we can wait a while, and maybe we could make it five years or maybe even 14 years. I don't know. The other dimension is the breadth. Which activities should copyright cover? We need to somewhat reduce that. But I don't think we should treat all works the same. I distinguish three categories of works. First of all, there are the functional works, the works you use to do a practical job in your life. Second, there are the works whose purpose is to say what certain people thought, to tell you that. And third, there are the works of art and entertainment whose contribution to society is in the impact of the work itself three different ways that a work can make a contribution to society. And these different ways have different implications about what freedom we need to have in using those works. So first let's look at the functional practical works. These include software, recipes, educational works, reference works, text fonts, patterns for sewing, anything that you use to make something or do something. Well, these works must be free for the same reason that software must be free which is software being a, one of this category because when you use the work to do a job if you can't control what the work does you can't control your life so you must be free to change the work to make it do the thing you want to do and then you should be free to publish your version because there'll be other people who want to do the same form of the job that you wanted to do. And we must make it possible for you to contribute to society your improvements, at least in your opinion and probably other people's opinion, their improvements, because some people might prefer the original version. That's fine, too. And it follows from this that people need to be free to redistribute the unchanged copies also because otherwise you just force people to make some trivial unimportant change to be allowed to distribute it and that's silly 
and it just causes confusion that we could avoid. So these works need to be free, but people might make the objection, if we don't surrender our freedom and let publishers have power over us when we use these works, the works won't be made. So they're essentially counseling us to despair and give up our freedom. And 20 years ago, perhaps that might have seemed rationally plausible. But today we know empirically that it's not true. Look at the success of the free software movement with many thousands of useful applications, as well as free operating systems and free desktops and free office suites and a very large range of capabilities. Then look at all the recipes that circulate effectively as if they weren't copyrighted. And people are accustomed to exercising the same four freedoms in their use of recipes. Then in reference works, we can see a number of very good and useful free reference works, including, for instance, Wikipedia. Now, when people think about Wikipedia, they tend to focus more on a side issue, namely the fact that it's developed with a wiki, which turns out to be a very good method, but it's only a method. What really makes the ethical difference is the fact that the text in Wikipedia is free. It's released under a free license, so you're free to copy it and change it and redistribute it. Free educational materials is an area that hasn't had a tremendous success yet, but it is getting started. There's now a site called uh, freetextbookproject.org, I think, which uh, has been set up to list available free textbooks. And I hope that in 10 years or 20 years, every class will have free educational materials, free as in freedom, to make available, and that educational works will be free. We shouldn't panic and give up our freedom. We should insist on freedom in the long term. That's what we need. But then what about the second category, the works whose contribution to society is to say what certain people thought? For instance, memoirs, essays of opinion, scientific papers. For these works, m publishing a modified version is just misrepresenting somebody. So that's not a contribution to society. And I see no reason why people should necessarily be free to do so. That makes it possible to propose a reduced copyright system in which everyone has the freedom to non-commercially redistribute exact copies, but commercial use and modification require permission as today. This would give us the freedom we absolutely must have so as to eliminate the cruel and draconian war on sharing, which is part of copyright today. This freedom, the freedom to non-commercially redistribute exact copies, is the minimum freedom that people must have for all published works, because sharing is good. Sharing creates the bonds of society. To attack sharing is to attack society. We must not tolerate this. Because it is such an attack on society, the only way to stop people from sharing is with harsh punishments and nasty brainwashing. You'll hear campaigns that try to convince you that sharing is theft, that if you help your neighbor, that's the equivalent of attacking a ship. <laughs> we must put an end to the war on sharing. We must legalize sharing. However, it's okay for these works if the commercial use and modified versions remain under a copyright system more or less like the present one. And that system would provide some income to the authors in more or less the same lousy and adequate way as the present system. Usually lousy and inadequate with occasional rare exceptions. And so it would still continue doing a pretty bad job of encouraging the production of more such works. What about the third category, works of art and entertainment? Well, for that, I had to wrestle with the question of publishing modified versions for a number of years because there are valid arguments on both sides. On one side, there's the argument that a work can have an artistic integrity which modification could destroy. And I think that is sometimes true, although not as often as the authors will claim it's true. Look at how most of them allow Hollywood to completely trash their work in exchange for enough money. But there are a few who insist that Hollywood must respect the integrity of their work. Okay, so some of these authors do have artistic integrity. But look at the arguments on the other side. For instance, there is the folk process through which a series of artists can transform a work, and this can sometimes produce something very rich. But if we want to consider only specific named 
artists, consider Shakespeare. Some of Shakespeare's plays used stories that were copied from other works published just a few decades before. If today's copyright law had existed then, those plays would have been infringing and they would probably never have been written. And if Shakespeare or whoever actually wrote those plays had complained, the copyright holders would have said, Shakespeare just wants to make a cheap ripoff and you know that's not worth anything. And since we would never have seen what the play would be, we would have had no firm evidence to oppose to that claim. Since we have seen those plays, we say that they're at least very good. That's only because there weren't copyright holders who were in a position to stop them from being written. But eventually I recognized that although modifying a work of art can be a further contribution to art, it's not urgent. If it had to wait 10 years for the copyright to expire, that would be something we could live with. For works of practical use, it's intolerable to have to wait 10 years before you can redistribute your modified version of the recipe or the program or whatever. For art, it's not so urgent. So we can propose the same reduced copyright system where everyone is free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies, but commercial use and modification are under the control of copyright more or less as now. I don't believe that all art must be free, but I do believe that all art must be shareable, a weaker criterion. That's what I recommend. Thus, in particular, sharing on the internet peer-to-peer -peer must be legal. It's not a bad thing at all. Now, the record companies will tell you that if you do this, you're taking money away from the musicians and that that's horrible. Well, you've heard that a half-truth is worse than a lie. This is a perhaps 5% truth. It's less than half, but not zero. So it has the same flaw, you see, as a half-truth. There are some musicians who would get money if you buy their records. Those are the long-established superstars. Not all superstars, just the long-established ones. When musicians get a first record contract, it's a really nasty exploitative one in which all the production and publicity expenses are treated as an advance to the musicians, even though they didn't actually go to the musicians. What that means is that if you buy the record, there's a certain fraction of the price which is nominally for the musicians, but they don't actually get that money because instead it goes to repay the so-called advance, which means it goes from one account on the record company to another and there it stays. It is very rare that a record sells so many copies that it actually fully repays this and starts to give money to the musicians. It can go platinum, I've read, without reaching that point. It's only the record company that isn't getting money. There are some superstars who finish their first contract, which typically is for five or seven albums, and then they're in a position to negotiate another contract which doesn't mistreat them. Those musicians will get money when you buy their records, but the rest don't. So when I buy commercial CDs, since they are not records of superstars, I do feel guilty for failing to support the musicians. But what can I do? Because of this, I don't think we should worry that legalizing sharing is going to hurt anything. But we might want a system that does a better job of supporting artists than the existing system, which mainly supports various companies, it mainly makes some rich people richer. I have a couple of suggestions to make. One is a tax-based system. If you tax something vaguely connected with copying music, which could be blank discs or internet connection, or you could just take the money out of general revenue and distribute it directly to musicians and, and other artists, and only to artists, only to them. It should be in the law that nobody else can get it except musicians or artists of whatever kinds you're trying to support. Those who participated in the creative work, not companies, not organizations, just artists. And it should be distributed based on their popularity, which could be measured by polling, approximated, but well enough, but not in linear proportion. Because a superstar can be a thousand times as popular as a good, fairly successful artist. If A is a thousand times as popular as B, then if you distribute the money in linear proportion, A will get a thousand times as much money as B. B doesn't get enough to live on, 
or the tax has to be very big in order to make A tremendously rich. So what I propose is take the raw popularity figure determined by polling and take the cube root and distribute the money in proportion to the cube root so that if A is a thousand times as popular as B, A will get ten times as much money as B. Well, that's still more, but not so much more, which means that the bulk of the money will go to supporting a lot of fairly good, fairly successful artists instead of going to a few superstars. That means the system will be efficient for doing its legitimate job, which is to support a lot of artists which, after all, is the only reason to want to have any kind of copyright system on art. I've seen proposals for something somewhat like this in the music field, but there's a fatal flaw because they talk about, quote, compensating, unquote, the, quote, rights holders, unquote. And what that means is the money will go to the record companies in linear proportion to the success of the records. And mostly the musicians won't get any. Well, if that is the excuse to legalize sharing, well, at least it does some good, but you shouldn't fool yourselves that that makes this our lousy current system of supporting musicians any better than it is now. So we have to reject those terms, quote, compensating, unquote, and quote, rights holders, unquote, if we want a system that will actually support the arts better. I told you one proposal. The other is a system of voluntary payments. Imagine if every player had a button with a dollar sign on it. If you push that, you send a dollar to whoever made the work you are currently using or just finished using. And you can push it if you want or not. I think this system would work great because we're already seeing that artists can get a lot of money from voluntary payments. A lot of people want to send money to support artists. And the main obstacle is just that it's difficult to send it. Well, if we make it easy, the artists will get a lot more. In the past year, uh, a couple of famous musical groups, Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails, released albums and effectively said to people, pay if you want. And they got hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is not a mean amount. It's not just for the superstars like them that this can work. There's a Canadian singer that I've heard of, although I don't think I ever heard any of her music, who was called Jane Sibbery, and I think she's now called Issa or something. I know nothing about her except that she sells copies of recordings through her website and lets people choose how much to pay, any amount starting from zero. And on the average, she gets more money than the major record companies charge for a download. So by allowing people not to pay, she actually, on the average, gets them to pay more. And she's not a superstar, as far as I can tell, because I never heard of her except in an article about this. It already works, even with the inconvenient payment systems we have today that require people to have credit cards. If we had a convenient, anonymous payment system, I know I would push this button at least once a week, if not once a day. Of course, there are poor people who would never push this button, and that's fine. The artists don't need to squeeze money out of poor people. There are enough people who aren't poor who can gladly support the arts. And if we collectively think that we wish people would do it more, we could launch friendly, kind, warm PR campaign. Have you sent a dollar to a band or a TV producer this week? If not, why not? You love what they're doing, push the button. <laughs> and, you know, people would hear this and they'd feel warm and they would do it. So much better than the cruel and vicious PR campaign that says that if you share, you're a pirate. You referenced a publisher um, that did not restrict uh, original author's rights. Could you name the publisher? Oh, well, the publisher, I said, was willing to publish books under a free license if the author asks for it. That's O'Reilly. What are your comments on the impact of DRM on the self publishers On, I don't know how they affect self-publishers. Uh, basically, as a self-publisher, you probably can't employ DRM. The DRM conspiracies require people to join the conspiracy to publish restricted copies also. And I produce uh, Blu-ray discs. 
to market to mine. You probably can't get the information about how to make a defective Blu-ray disc. The industry minister about this bill C-61, his response was that this bill was necessary to bring Canada in line with the WIPO treaty. Canada should reject the WIPO treaty. WIPO is an evil organization, as you can tell from the fact that its name includes the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote. There is no valid reason for any country to sign this treaty. That's the response there. Well, it's, it's pressure from the mega corporations that dominate the governments. Freedom of the software and money as being barrier to this freedom. How do you see money as being barrier? I think that's too general a statement. I wouldn't say that. It's true that there is a practice that is lucrative of developing and releasing proprietary software. Well, I think that's an unethical practice and we should put an end to it. But I don't think that money in general is an obstacle to free software. Money tempts people to do a lot of bad things. But on the other hand, free software is quite consistent with other kinds of business, and a lot of people are paid to write free software. You have an issue with the, um, not with the purchasing of a DVD, but the uh, inability to uh, play it on any system. Well, and also the stopping you from copying it. Okay. That, that's wrong. I don't object to selling or buying anything, uh, including free software. Part of the freedom that free software gives you is the freedom to make copies and sell them. And uh, these days, with the internet working so well uh, as a distribution medium, you don't see a lot of people selling copies of free software for much money. In 1985, I used to sell magnetic tapes with a free program I had written, and I charged $150 for a tape, and I got eight to 10 orders a month which I could have lived on if necessary. Of course, I'd also put the same program on an FTP server so that people on the net could download it. I didn't charge any money for that. There's no conflict here. If it's free software, you're free to do it both, either of these things or both in parallel or whatever you like. Some of it sounded like CC or Creative Commons. I'm just curious as to why you didn't bring up that. Well, Creative Commons doesn't advocate anything, anything at all. Creative Commons publishes licenses. All of the licenses Creative Commons publishes today are shareable. In two of these categories, what I've said is the works must all be shareable. Well, if you publish one under any of the Creative Commons licenses of today, it will be shareable. But Creative Commons doesn't advocate any freedom for the users of works in general. I think the Creative Commons licenses are fine for what they do. You shouldn't use them for software, and only two of them are free, so if the work is in the functional category, you should use those two. The attribution license and the attribution share alike license. Those two of the Creative Commons licenses are free licenses. So if you want to use a Creative Commons license for a functional work, it should be one of those two, like for a textbook or an encyclopedia. And for software, the best license to use in most cases is the GNU General Public License. Um, what do you see as the future of the mainstream uh, recording industry and uh, how can we facilitate and expedite its demise because I'm sick of Nickelback? Well, I can't see the future. I can't see the future because my crystal ball is cloudy. And I don't think there's anything bad about making records and selling them. And if we had laws that actually required record companies to pay the musicians, it might be a good thing. But the major record companies of today, because they have campaigned to attack our freedom, they deserve to be eliminated. One way to help put an end to them is uh, share music. And another way is demand the legalization of music sharing and demand that any sort of payments that the public makes through any government mandated or legally mandated payments that the public makes, that they, those payments go to the artists and only to the artists and that they that the proportions be adjusted so that it does a good job of supporting a wide range of artists. Leave the record companies out because we have to make sure that they don't get the money to attack us in the future. So these days, loosely coupled systems are very popular. Uh, web services and, and uh, standards-based communication between software and modules. Unfortunately, often the communication between web, web servers and the user is not based on a standard. Many web servers will distribute a non-free program to the user 
which gets installed silently into the user's browser and the result is that you're running non-free programs and you and the communication that they do with the uh, site it could be in any which protocol. So you could characterize this this idea of services, web services and so on as, be, as defeating the viral nature of the GPLS. Please do not insult me by comparing the GNU GPL to a virus. <laughs> The, the GNU GPL is not contagious. A program can't catch it by being in the same computer as another program that's released under the GNU GPL. Uh, the GNU GPL does not, in fa as a factual matter, does not spread like a virus. It spreads more like a spider plant. If you cut off some and you plant it somewhere else, then it grows there too. And if you don't want it to grow there, don't cut it off. It won't, it won't get there on its own. I think the big issue with, with web servers is, aside from the fact the tendency for them to distribute non-free programs quietly, is that it is in the case of things that you could call software as a service. There are people who give you the opportunity to use a program, but you can't have a copy. They keep the copy, and if you want to run the program, you have to send your data to them, and they run the program for you, and they send the data back. And the problem is, this way you lose control of your own computing. So you must not do this. And that, that's the only solution, is refuse to do this and develop free software to do it and distribute that, and then people can install the free program, and then they can do the same computing and have control over it. So software as a service is something we have to reject. But that's only a subset of all the web servers, because most of the things web servers do don't fall into that particular narrow category. They're things that you couldn't even conceive of doing on your own computer. But a great number of software as a service vendors allow you to download open source. Well, I'm not in favor of open source. I'm not in favor of open source. Open source was invented as a way of talking about free software and hushing up the ethical level of it. I won't accept, quote, open source, unquote, as a description of what I do or what I'm standing for. I'm not a supporter of open source. I am an activist in the free software movement. And in the free software movement, we talk about freedom and ethics. That's the most important thing. And that's exactly what the supporters of open source avoid ever mentioning. The problem with software as a service is that because you don't have a copy of the program and you're running somebody else's copy, he controls it and you don't. And that's true even if the program in question is released as free software. If it's released as free software, you could get a copy and you could run your copy. And then you'd have control over it. So that's the only way you can do it that is not a social problem. If you run it on his server, you have lost control. Now, I'm not saying all those people are malicious. Maybe a particular server is just running the very same program that they released to you, but you can't tell that. That is not a solution. For those cases, we've got to insist on running our own copies of a free program. That's the only way that you can control your computing. But as I said, this is a small subset of all the web servers in the world most of which do things that don't fall into this category. So we're gonna, we're gonna shut it down in here and uh, go to personal questions. Uh, there, there'll be a small reception up on the fourth floor uh, for any uh, of you who want to uh, pursue some of the questioning that's uh, continuing to roll along. I'd like to call on uh, Jason McIntosh to uh, thank Richard Stallman. Uh, on behalf of the Murphy Visiting Chair and the University of Calgary Faculty of Law, I'd like to present uh, Richard Stallman with this, this gift, and thank you very much for coming out today. So join the fight against C-62. <laughs> And it's not enough just to demand maintaining the status quo, because then they'll say, well, let's compromise, let's make a change that's half as bad. You've got to demand improvements in copyright law, making it less restrictive.